Thank you, Melissa, for that extremely kind and somewhat embarrassing introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for uh, coming to my talk. I'm going to tell you about the efforts from my lab and others to find new ways to use light to study and control phenomena at the interface of biology and electricity. And as Melissa said, I'm uh, mostly in chemistry and physics here. And I've also founded a company which is working on developing some of the technology that I'll tell you about today. OK, what is bioelectricity? This is uh, an artist's sketch of a multicellular organism. And if you zoom in by a factor of 100,000, you can see the individual cells inside of this organism. And these cells have an inside and an outside. And separating the inside from the outside, there's this very thin film. Um, it's a layer of grease uh, called a lipid bilayer. And if we zoom in by another factor of 10,000, we can get a close-up look at this lipid bilayer. So it's, it's grease here, and there's water on this side, and there's water on that side. And even though it's just a bag that the cell sits in, it's an incredibly complicated and rich place. It's a world unto itself. There are thousands of different kinds of proteins and molecules embedded in this layer. And these mediate every interaction between the cell and the outside world. So everything that comes into the cell or leaves the cell has to cross this layer. And this is how the cell senses what's going on in the outside world. Now, grease is an insulator. And these salt solutions on either side are conductors. And so you can have a charge difference across this membrane, which can lead to a voltage. And so you can have typically a little bit of excess positive charge on the outside and negative on the inside. And this voltage pulls on all of the charges in all of these molecules in the membrane. So you can think of the voltage across one of these lipid layers as a universal regulator of the energetics for everything that's going on inside of this membrane. It's pulling on everything. Okay? And lipid bilayers like this are all over biology, not just around the outsides of cells, but also compartmentalizing little organelles within cells. And anywhere there's a, one of these layers, you might expect there to be interesting electrical phenomena. If you open a pore in the layer, you can let ions through, and you can change this voltage. And this is a way to have something that happens on this side of the layer. If you open a pore, you can change the voltage, which will affect what's going on someplace very far away, maybe on the opposite side of the cell. So it's also a way to transmit information, because electrical signals can propagate along these lipid bilayers. So where do we find bioelectric effects in the world? The first quantitative measurements were in the late 1870s when people discovered that Venus flytraps generate a little electrical impulse when they close. And if you look around, they've been discovered in um, almost everything that has a bilayer. So plants have voltages of about a quarter of a volt. So this is in millivolt, about a quarter of a volt. Uh, fungi, we don't know why, but have unusually large voltages across their membranes. In the mitochondria, which are little organelles inside of our cells that uh, produce ATP, part of the energy that generates the ATP comes from a voltage of a about minus 180 millivolts. Bacteria have a voltage across their membranes, which they also use to power their generation of ATP, their energy source. Our heart is regulated by an electrical pacemaker. And our brain is also an electrically active organ. And in fact, every cell in our body has some sort of voltage across it. And these voltages change depending upon the environment. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about this organ. We all have anecdotal experience with this. It's really incredible that you can put your finger up against your head, and you're within one centimeter of this organ. And it doesn't look like anything special. It's just a sort of, you know, it looks like a cantaloupe, sort of. But this is one of the most mysterious and complex um, pieces of matter in the universe. So inside each of our heads, we have about 100 billion neurons. And each one of these neurons has about 10,000 connections to other neurons. These neurons communicate with each other by sending little electrical blips down their membranes, little changes in this membrane voltage. These blips are about a tenth of a volt high, and they last about 1 1,000th of a second. Okay. So every thought and hope and dream and feeling that we have, every sensation, is encoded in these little blips traveling down our neurons. So it would be really nice if we had a good way to measure these. Traditionally, uh, people measure bioelectric phenomena by impaling electrodes into a cell. And that's, it works, 
but it's a very difficult and laborious thing. You have to you know, get this electrode into the cell, and it damages the cell, and you can only look at one or a few points at a time. You can't get the global view. We'd really like to just look at a piece of brain or any other collection of cells and see the voltage as it moves around in these cells. The challenge is, if you just look at one of these cells, there's no natural contrast mechanism associated with the voltage. So just as if I look at this wire, I can't tell whether there's a voltage in this wire or not. Similarly, if I just look at a cell, there's no way to see what the voltage is. So we need some contrast agent, something to convert the voltage in a cell into some sort of an optical signal that we can see. Okay. This is an artist's rendition of what we'd like to do. We'd like to uh, make neurons light up when they fire. And in many movies, you see this. The opening scene of Fight Club has uh, neurons flashing uh, in somebody's head. And it's a sort of obvious thing to want to do. People have been working on this since the late 1960s. And the challenge is to find something that you can put in the membrane that will produce light or produce some optical signal in a way that responds quickly and sensitively and ideally doesn't kill the thing you're trying to look at and um, is something that you can target to particular cells so you can see what each class of cells is doing. And the signals we're after are these electrical blips called action potentials. Tenth of a volt high, thousandth of a second long. All right, so how do we go about lighting things up? Before I talk about electrical impulses in cells, I want to talk a little bit about, in general, how biologists light things up. So if you go out into the world, not the world of Cambridge, Massachusetts in late February, but if you go out to, for instance, a coral reef, you see all of this color, right? The world is full of beautiful colored things. And that's because all of these different creatures are expressing different, they're producing different proteins, each of which has different colors associated with it. And over the last uh, decades, scientists have figured out how to take this incredible diversity of molecular function in the natural world and to use these things as tinker toys and to take components from some of these creatures and to transfer them to other creatures and thereby to imbue optical or responsive properties to some other creature. And this is a theme that I want to keep coming back to. There's this incredible resource of diversity and function which has evolved in the natural world, which now we're figuring out how to cut and paste and apply in wild and wonderful new ways. So how do we do this? I'll give you one example. Uh, and this is a fairly famous example. This is a jellyfish. It turns out to be a luminescent jellyfish. Uh, so you can see it in the dark. It glows a little bit. And um, several decades ago, people discovered that the light from this fish is coming from this particular protein. So this is one one billionth of a meter, about one one hundred thousandth of a hair. And if you shine violet light on this protein, it produces blue light, uh, which you can see. Okay? And there's a chemical reaction in this um, jellyfish which excites this protein and produces this light. So there's this, here's this glowing creature. And people realized that this protein is encoded for by a DNA sequence. You can take the DNA out of the jellyfish and put it into, for instance, a virus. If you then infect a cell with this virus, the virus will deliver the DNA. And then the cell will see this genetic message. It will produce RNA and then protein. And so then the um, cell will get lit up just like the jellyfish. And you can, in fact, engineer whole organisms to express these uh, green fluorescent proteins. So here's just an example of a glowing green monkey. Right? And this is obviously extremely useful to be able to light up monkeys <laughs> like this. So now, jellyfish um, have this nice green color. And I showed you in that coral reef there are creatures of all different colors. People have now figured out how to um, take different fluorescent proteins and label different cells in order to make multicolor monkeys and uh, mice and other creatures. And so I'll give you an example of how that's being used to study the structure of neurons. This is from the work of uh, Jeff Lichtman and Josh Sainz here at Harvard. So they took a mouse and genetically modified this mouse so that different neurons in its brain, each one expressed a different combination of these fluorescent proteins. And so then if you look in the brain, you see this incredibly beautiful um, mosaic of these cells as they're um, wired up with, with each other. And um, 
This is great. This lets us now see how these cells are connected to each other. If we just looked at the brain without doing this, it would just look like gray mush. This technique is called brainbow for obvious reasons. Okay? Here's just another beautiful image of uh, some neurons in the brain of a mouse, each one lit with a different color. And so here we can see how they're connected. And these are beautiful images, but they're static images. All we can see here is the structure. And we'd really like to use light to interact with the function of these neurons, right? Neurons do stuff. And we want to use light both to stimulate them and to record from them. So first, I'm going to talk about using light to uh, stimulate neurons. And this story starts here. This is a view from an airplane looking down. Does anybody know where this photo is taken from? Somebody whispered it. That's right. This is San Francisco Bay. If you're flying into San Francisco Airport, um, just north of San Jose, San Jose is down here, you can see these ponds where people are evaporating seawater to make salt. Okay? And if you look down, you see these beautiful colors. So where do these colors come from? There are microorganisms growing in the water, which are producing proteins, which they use to absorb sunlight. And they have a variety of different colored proteins, which absorb sunlight which they use, for instance, to swim to the surface when it's bright, but then to swim further down if there's too much ultraviolet to avoid ultraviolet light. And then other microorganisms use some of these proteins to harvest energy from sunlight. Okay? So there are actually thousands of varieties of proteins which these microorganisms use to um, interact with sunlight. And I'll just give you an exam some examples of what some of these are. There's uh, this protein called bacteriorhodopsin. Uh, which sits in a membrane and absorbs sunlight and pumps charge out of the cell. There's proteins that let chloride ions into the cells. There's light-gated channels. So this is a protein called channelrhodopsin, where when you shine blue light on it, it opens a little pore in the membrane and lets ions flow through. And then there's other uh, light-activated signaling molecules. The particular class of proteins that I'm talking about here are called microbial rhodopsins. They're structurally similar to the proteins we use in our eyes for vision. And what unifies these proteins is that they have this uh, little molecule here called um, retinal. It's a half of a beta carotene, which absorbs the sunlight. Okay? And so the sunlight comes in, it interacts with this molecule, and then there's a change in the protein. A neat fact about these proteins is that they come in all the colors of the rainbow. And so the color of these proteins is tuned by the structure of the protein and its interaction with this chromophore with the retina. Okay? So here we have these proteins where you can shine light on them. And these creatures use these proteins to induce a change in the voltage in the membrane. Okay? So you can think of these like the world's smallest photovoltaic devices. Light comes in, and a voltage, there's a change in voltage uh, comes out. So several years ago, people realized that you could take the genes for these proteins, say from this little single-celled creature here, and put them into other life forms, like mice and worms and viruses, and thereby gain optical control over the electrical activity in the cells in these other creatures. And so I'll give you an example of that. This is work from my friend Feng Zhang um, when he was a grad student at Stanford. This is a mouse, and it has an optical fiber going into its head. And Fung injected this mouse with a virus which had within it the gene for this protein channel rhodopsin. This is a blue light activated ion channel. So when you shine blue light on it, it opens a little pore in the membrane of the neuron, and it can cause the neuron to fire. Okay? And in this particular mouse, the uh, channel rhodopsin is in its motor cortex. So here's the mouse. You can't see it, but there's an optical fiber going into its head, and it's in a bucket. And so um, the mouse is going around. And at a certain point, the blue light will go on. And when the light goes on, the mouse starts running in circles. Right? You see that? Oops, sorry. And it will keep running in circles as long as that blue light is on. And then when the light goes off, the mouse returns to its previous behavior. Okay. Here I'll show you another example. This is also a mouse where it's had the same virus, uh, encoding channel rhodopsin, injected into a part of its brain that controls aggression. Okay? So here's the mouse. Here's the optical fiber. Here's a rubber glove. Now, normally, mice will sniff the glove and ignore it. 
And you'll see what happens here when the light turns on um, in the mouse's brain. So there's the mouse, the light goes on, <laughs> and the mouse attacks the glove, and then the light turns off, and the mouse goes back to its previous behavior. And then the light will turn on again at some point. And it attacks the glove again. Okay. People have used this um, ability to turn on and off specific populations of neurons with light to study the role of many different subclasses of neurons in many complex behaviors. So not just uh, locomotion and aggression, but feeding, sleeping, mating, um, all, all sorts of um, uh, behaviors, drinking, social interactions, and so on. And so this is great. This is a tool for laser mind control. And that's obviously, um, you know, has lots of applications towards studying the role of neurons in behavior. I'll give you one example of how this is being applied now to a challenge in human health. There is um, a disease called retinitis pigmentosa where the um, light sensitive uh, photoreceptors in the eye degrade and this causes blindness. So people have now been taking the gene uh, for channel rhodopsin and expressing it in the remaining neurons in the eye and imbuing these neurons with light sensitivity and restoring vision. And this works in mice. So you can take a mouse and put it in a maze where there's six exits. Well, there's six de five dead ends, one exit with a light. And a blind mouse won't be able to find the exit because it can't see the light. But if you've injected the virus with channel rhodopsin into its eyes, then the mouse can find the exit um, quite quickly. And now there are clinical trials going on in humans to try to use this um, technique to restore vision in people who have um, had retinal, uh, retinal degeneration. So here we have this amazing tool for converting light into a change in a bioelectric signal. Now, a few years ago, I said to myself, I wonder if we can run these things in reverse. Okay? So instead of having light come in and a change in voltage come out, can we use the endogenous voltage changes in a cell to induce some optical signal that we can see? Okay? So instead of light in and voltage out, we want voltage in and light out. Simple. Now, I'm going to skip three years of really hard work and tell you that, yes, that works. Okay? The uh, gene we use comes from a microorganism that lives here in the Dead Sea. This is a single-celled archaeal microorganism that produces a protein which it uses to harvest solar energy to power its metabolism. Okay? This protein is called archaeorhodopsin 3. So the natural function of this protein is to absorb green sunlight and to pump protons, hydrogen ions, out of the cell to generate a voltage, which then this creature uses to power its metabolism, to produce ATP. We figured out a way to run this protein in reverse. So we shine red light on the protein. And if there's a change in the voltage across the membrane, then this protein produces near-infrared fluorescence, which we can see. Okay? And you see this works in PowerPoint, and so that's very encouraging. <laughs> so now I'll show you some real data. This is a human tumor cell into which we've injected the DNA for this protein. And so the cell is producing the protein. And we're looking at it in the microscope. The protein is sitting in the membrane. You can see it's mostly around the edge of the cell. And we're looking at the fluorescence. And you can see that the cell is lit up. Now, what you can't see in the picture is there's a little glass capillary jammed into the back of the cell. And I'll show you a movie of what happens as we apply steps in voltage between plus and minus one-tenth of a volt. And this is just a wild-type protein straight out of this creature in the Dead Sea. We haven't done anything to it. So what you should see is that when the voltage goes up, the protein gets bright. And when the voltage goes down, the protein gets dim. And that's great. Over the next few years, we engineered this protein. So we mutated it a lot in order to optimize its properties, to make it brighter and faster and more sensitive. And that's the protein that I'll talk to you about. So we wanted to put this in neurons. And so we needed some neurons. Turns out anybody can get neurons um, over the internet. There's a company called brainbits.com. 
and you um, put in your credit card, and they will FedEx overnight to you um, a sample of live rat brain. It's on ice. And so we mushed up these rat brains and cultured the neurons in a dish. And then we took the gene for the protein and we put it into a virus, and we infected the neurons with this virus, so they started producing the protein. And so then these neurons lit up. And here's an example. So we took a little electrode and we jammed it into the cell, and we shocked the cell to get it to start firing. And here's a conventional electrical recording of the cell. And then we looked in the microscope at the fluorescence, and we recorded the fluorescence at the same time. And what you should see here is that there's a correspondence. Every time the cell fires, we see this flash of fluorescence coming from the cell. Now, because we're doing this in a microscope, we can take movies of what a neuron looks like when it fires. So here's a movie. Um, remember, these events are extremely brief, only one one thousandth of a second. And so we run the camera at 1,000 frames a second, very fast. And here's a movie of what a neuron looks like when it fires. We're stimulating it right here. There's a little electrode. Um, jammed into the cell, which you can't quite see. And so when the neuron fires, we see it light up like this. Okay? And this was the first time that it was possible to take a movie of how an electrical impulse propagates through a neuron using one of these genetically encoded reporters. Great. Now, one of the limitations in uh, this experiment is we still had to use that electrode to stimulate the cell to fire, even though we could see the firing with light. And that partially defeats the purpose of having this optical readout, because you still have to go and find the cell and get this electrode and jam it into the cell, and that kills the cell eventually. But I showed you before this mouse, where by shining blue light into the mouse's brain, people could make those neurons fire and uh, make the mouse run around in circles or attack the glove. And so I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could combine these two molecular tools. We'll put the channel rhodopsin, the blue light activated protein, the one that makes the neuron fire in the neuron. So when we shine blue light on the cell, it will fire. And then we'll also put this archirhodopsin into the cell, and we'll shine red light on that, so that when the cell fires, we'll see that as a flash of red light. Okay? So the idea of the experiment is we're going to flash blue light onto a cell, and that will trigger the cell to fire. And then we'll see that firing as a flash of red light. Okay? So now we can interact with the cells entirely with light, with no mechanical electrode. And we developed an optical system to do this. Here I'll show you a movie. This is at 500 frames a second, slowed down tenfold so we can see what's going on. This is a pretty big field of view. It's uh, about 1.5 millimeters by 3 millimeters. And there's maybe 50 neurons in this field of view. So this is mushed up brain where we've cultured these neurons in a dish. They're still alive. And they've wired themselves up uh, in a more or less random way. Uh, but they're able to signal to each other still. And we filter out the blue light. But there'll be a little uh, circle here which uh, comes on when we turn on the blue light. Okay. So here these cells are sitting here. And then we turn on the light. And you can see they start to flash. And we can record every event in every cell as these cells are firing. So this is what's going on in your brain as you're watching this. Right? And then when the light goes off, um, they stop. Your neurons, of course, keep going. And so we can record now um, in parallel from many, many cells. Great. Now here, we're using just flood illumination. We're illuminating all of the cells at once with blue light. But I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could take blue light and target just one cell here, or maybe even a piece of a cell, and stimulate that cell, and then watch this impulse go through that cell and through the other cells? And light is easy to send in different directions. And so we can sort of play the piano on this neural circuit and stimulate different cells in different combinations of space and time to try to understand what kinds of computations, what kind of processing this uh, circuit is doing. You know, if you want to understand how like, a real electric circuit works, you would maybe inject voltage in one place and measure it in another place and go around with your multimeter in order to see how the circuit works. So we want to do the same thing with these neurons. So to do that, we um, hacked a video projector. We took apart a video projector, just like the one that's displaying this image. And in the video projector, there's something called a digital micromirror array. This is a microchip, which has on it about a million mirrors each mirror can individually be switched on or off to either reflect light out or not. Okay? 
And so in that projector, there's a lamp which goes onto this micromirror array, and it modulates the light and projects this image onto the screen. We now take this micromirror array, and we shine our blue laser onto it. And so then we modulate the blue light. We impart whatever pattern we want onto the blue light. And we project that pattern onto the cells in the microscope. So we can project an arbitrary pattern of blue light, arbitrary in space and time, onto the cells to tickle them in whatever pattern we like. We then use flood illumination with red light to see the response of every cell in the circuit. Okay. Just to demonstrate that this actually works, I took a video from YouTube and played it into the microscope onto a fluorescent film. Okay? So there, there's no uh, cells here, just a film of fluorescent plastic. And I'll show you what we see in the microscope while playing this YouTube video. I hope you can make out the contrast. <laughs> it's a juggling clown. And a single cell is about this big on the scale. Okay? So you can really stimulate the cells in any pattern of space and time that you want. So I'll give you an example of how we use this now to study how signals propagate from one cell to another. So here are two neurons. Um, they're both expressing this uh, optopatch construct, so the light-gated actuator and the fluorescent reporter. I've just artificially colored them different colors so you can tell them apart. One's green, one's blue. And now we're going to optically stimulate just the cell body of this one. And what you'll see is that this neuron will start to fire a volley of these action potentials, of these spikes. That signal will propagate down. There's a synapse somewhere around here, which is, we can't quite see. And then the signal will hop across the synapse and trigger a response in the next neuron. And now this goes by um, pretty quickly, so you have to pay attention here. This is at uh, 1,000 frames a second. Okay. So um, the upstream cell fired, and then there was a response in the downstream cell. So this gives us a tool now for studying how these electrical signals get from one cell to another. And you can add drugs, which can, for instance, block the signal or modulate it. And you can see which biochemical pathways are involved in how these signals propagate within a cell and from one cell to its neighbor. Here I'll just show you another movie. Um, this is, again, a single neuron where we're optically stimulating the cell body here. So there's no electrodes. And we're looking at the fluorescence um, coming from this neuron. This movie is, again, at 1,000 frames per second. Right. And now this movie highlights one of the challenges we face in doing experiments like this. We're taking the movie at 1,000 frames per second, but one of these electrical spikes only lasts about 1 1,000th of a second. So we just have the time resolution to detect these events, but not really the time resolution to see how these things propagate through a cell. We'd like to image much faster, but we actually have the best camera that money can buy, and um, we can't image any faster. There is no camera that could do this faster. One of my students came up with a very clever computational technique, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, for looking at the timing of these impulses at each pixel in the movie and inferring the timing with a precision much, much better than the exposure time of the camera. And this works because these impulses have a stereotyped shape, and so we can sort of figure out where, when they occurred, even though we're only sampling at discrete intervals. Using this trick, we can now reconstruct how these impulses propagate with much higher time resolution. So here I'll give you an example. This is now the same cell, where I'll now show you at 20,000 frames a second what one of these electrical impulses looks like when we stimulate up here at the cell body. And so you can actually see now how these signals propagate through a cell. Here we're using our little video projector to target the blue light just to the cell body up here. Here's another um, example. Here we're stimulating just the edge of this cell over here. This movie is at 50,000 frames a second. And here's another example where we're, again, stimulating the center of the cell. This one's at 100,000 frames per second. And so you can really see in detail 
how, for the first time, how these electrical impulses propagate through a cell. And then if you introduce a mutation, perhaps associated with a, a disease, or you uh, add a drug, you can see how that affects the propagation through the cell, which is the fundamental unit of uh, mental processing. Okay. Great. All right. So we've been um, working, uh, those were uh, neurons from rat or mouse brains. And I really wanted to look at human neurons. Okay. And so I asked my students if anybody would be willing to donate their brain uh, for the cause of science. And strangely, people were very um, reluctant to do that. And so we needed to find a different way to get human neurons. And um, it turns out you can just do this over the internet. And I'll explain how in just a second. Okay? Before, before I um, explain how we do it, I just want to tell you a little bit more about why we're interested in looking at human neurons. There are a great many diseases of the nervous system, degenerative diseases, developmental diseases, psychiatric diseases, for which we really have no ability to treat or to ameliorate the severity of the disease. And part of the challenge has been that our brains are special. Um, they're quite different from the brains of mice um, or other creatures. And um, there's no good way to go about identifying biochemical mechanisms or testing drugs in the human brain. You can't do it on people in any sort of, with any sort of throughput. And um, the animal models are very limited uh, in terms of reproducing the symptoms of human neuropsychiatric and neurodevelopmental diseases. So I thought, and this is not just my idea, but many people have thought, if we could somehow get access to human cells, we could perhaps do a better job understanding the mechanisms of these diseases. And one disease that we're um, interested in, in particular, is ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a motor neuron degenerative disease. So people who have this have um, gradual paralysis, and uh, it typically kills people within about two years. So it's a very terrible disease for which there is no treatment. Okay? So here's an example of somebody who has this disease. And the question is, how would we get neurons, say, from somebody like this, to compare to neurons from a healthy person with the hope that we could identify something about what's different in the neurons from somebody who has the disease. And this is work in collaboration with Kevin Egan's lab uh, in the stem cells department. So it turns out that all the cells in our body are pretty much genetically identical. The only things that distinguish our skin from our brain from our heart are which genes are turned on. But the information is there in every cell to make any cell in the body. And over the last few years, people have figured out how to take some skin from either a patient or a healthy person, and you add the right factors, and you can turn those skin cells into something called induced pluripotent stem cells. So you take them back through embryonic development into this um, fetal-like state. And then you can take them forward through embryonic development down a different pathway, and you can turn them into neurons, which you can grow in a dish, and they'll wire up and they'll start to fire. And those neurons are genetically identical to the ones in the head of the patient. Okay? And so this, for the first time, gives us access to human neurons. And of course, when the neurons are in the dish, you can do whatever you want to them. And you can grow as many of them as you like. And so now, all of a sudden, it becomes something that we can start to play with. Right? And this is an art form doing this conversion. And there's many different ways that people do it. But for now, let's just take it that we can now take skin from a patient, from anybody in this room, and convert those skin cells into neurons and study them in the dish. So our mission is to um, take people, healthy ones and people with diseases, and make neurons and introduce the genes for this optical electrophysiology, and then study these cells, maybe apply drugs to them, see if we can find a drug that makes the cells from the sick person start to behave like the cells from a healthy person, or to try to understand what's different about these two classes of cells. There's a lot of analysis that goes into this data. And ultimately, our dream, which we haven't gotten to yet, is to then use that to inform therapy of patients. So I'll just walk you through something about how this pipeline actually works. So working with uh, Kevin's lab, we um, studied some neurons almost derived from a patient who had ALS. Okay? And this particular patient had a mutation, um, one amino acid in one protein which caused the disease. Kevin's lab took the stem cells from this person 
and edited the genome to correct this one mutation. So now we have two populations of cells, which are genetically identical in all regards except for one amino acid and one protein. And one population of these cells should manifest symptoms of the disease, and the other population shouldn't. Okay? So we grow these cells in the dish, and we stimulate them with, with, with light, and uh, we see these um, patterns of flashing as the cells fire. Okay? Then there's a huge amount of statistics we have to do in order to deconvolve these um, images. Here, there's a whole bunch of neurons sitting on top of each other. So th this is uh, many different voices talking at once. We have to separate that out to figure out what the individual voices in the image are. And we identify all of the spikes. We look at the patterns. We do this hundreds of times over and over on neurons with the disease and neurons, uh, the, the healthy controls. And then we ask the question, OK, is there a difference statistically in the firing patterns of the disease neurons and the healthy neurons? And this, this picture here actually highlights why it's important to do this hundreds of times over and over. Here are five neurons, which are all identical nominally, all sitting in this cluster. But you can see they have very different firing patterns. These neurons are very heterogeneous. There's hundreds of different types of neurons. So in order to make statistically meaningful conclusions about what we're seeing here, we need to measure many, many, many cells. Traditionally, the way these cells are measured is by poking them with electrodes. And doing that, a skilled person can maybe measure 10 cells in a day. And that's just not compatible with getting the kinds of statistics you need in order to really um, infer anything meaningful and robust about these cells. You need to look at hundreds or thousands of cells. So we do that. And um, the kinds of data that come out are things like this. So here's a plot of the probability of firing, so how quickly these cells are spiking, as a function of time as we stimulate the cells harder and harder. And the red ones are the cells which have this mutation associated with the disease, and the black ones are the healthy controls. And the curves are different. The disease-associated cells fire more when we're not stimulating them. They have more baseline firing. But they get tired more easily when we stimulate them more strongly. It turns out that this higher baseline firing, this higher excitability of the cells, actually correlates with a clinical manifestation of the disease. In patients who have this disease, if you electrically stimulate their motor neurons, people find that their motor neurons are more excitable. Okay. Now, prior to um, us doing this work, um, in Kevin Egan's lab, they then found a drug which reduced the excitability of the neurons with the disease. And importantly, doing that prolonged the survival of the cells in the dish. So it showed that this enhanced excitability is not just a side effect of the disease, but it's actually part of the mechanism by which these cells are dying. And now they're going on to do clinical trials of this drug in uh, patients with the disease. Okay? So the arc is we're taking um, this gene from this creature in the Dead Sea, putting it into these human-derived neurons, stimulating them with light, and looking at the firing patterns, and then trying to use this to diagnose and to um, test drugs ideally to find uh, new therapies for diseases like this. Okay, So I've been talking a lot about neurons. But at the beginning, I mentioned that there are these uh, lipid bilayers, these membranes, all over biology. And in principle, there might be interesting bioelectric effects in places where it just hasn't been possible to look before. It's really hard to get electrodes into things. And there are many things which have been inaccessible to conventional me measurements. And so new tools can lead to new discoveries and you know, explorations in new areas. So the kinds of things where it's been very difficult to look are things uh, that are very small, like bacteria or mitochondria. Nobody has ever gotten an electrode into a single intact bacterium before. They're just too small. Or things that are prickly, like immune cells. Maybe voltage plays some role in immune activation. Or something inside of a cell wall, like a yeast. It's very hard to get an electrode through the, through the cell wall. Or as I mentioned before with these stem cells, if you have thousands of different types of cells, or it's a very heterogeneous population, it's hard to imagine going one at a time at one hour per cell and characterizing this population. Or if you have something moving around, like dictyostelium, it's a little slime mold that crawls around. Or a sperm, it's hard to imagine chasing it with an electrode and harpooning it. Right? Or if you have something slowly changing, like a developing embryo, you can ask, is there electrical signaling going on between the different cell types in this embryo 
by which they try to coordinate their development to decide who becomes what. So I'll just give you a few examples of how we're starting to just look around and see what we see in electrical phenomena in different systems. Well, the heart is a famously electrically active organ. Here's a heart. In the heart, the electrical impulse is then coupled to a calcium flux. So calcium flows from outside the cell to inside the cell, and then that triggers release of more calcium, which is what makes the muscle contract. And so we thought it would be nice to look both at the voltage and the calcium in these cells at the same time. So we just took our voltage indicator protein, and we stapled it to another protein, which some colleagues developed, which is a calcium indicator. This one involves this jellyfish protein and another calcium sensing protein here from a chicken. Right? So you have something from the single-celled microorganism, a chicken, and a jellyfish stapled together. Okay? And this one is blue, and it reports calcium, and this one is red, and it reports voltage. Just as you can take human cells and make neurons, you can also take human cells and make cardiac cells. And you can grow these cardiac cells in a dish, and they'll start to beep, and they're genetically identical to the cells in the heart of the person who gave the skin. And you can do this on healthy people or on people with genetically-based cardiac diseases, and then you can compare and contrast and try drugs on the cells from the sick people and see if you can make them behave like cells from a healthy person. So here's a human cardiac cell. Again, we just buy these online. And then we introduce our gene. And here you can see the voltage signal and the calcium signal as the cell is beating away. And if you look closely in the calcium signal, you see these little flashes here? Those are called calcium sparks. And they correspond to individual puffs of calcium being released from the internal stores of calcium inside the cell. So you can really map how these signals are propagating within the cell and how drugs affect this propagation. Now, so far, all of the cells I've shown you have been cells in a dish. They've been dissociated from the parent creature. But of course, a lot of signaling depends on the context. And so we wanted to look in live animals. And the animal we started with is zebrafish. These are little fish. The adults are about two inches long. And we like these fish because the embryos, the young, are transparent. So you can take the whole fish, the live animal, and plunk it down on the microscope without doing any surgery. And you can look into this animal, and you can see all of its organs and their function. So um, we made a fish which expresses this calcium and voltage indicator in its heart. Okay? This calcium and voltage indicator, we call it caviar. So now we have caviar in fish. Right? That's a joke. <laughs> um, and here's an image of the calcium in the heart of this fish. So it's sitting there beating, and we can see this calcium wave. We've developed custom microscopes for mapping the electrical activity in the heart. Fish have a two-chambered heart. Here's the atrium. Here's the ventricle. And so as this heart beats away, we can see this electrical impulse traveling from the atrium to the ventricle. By taking many optical slices like this inside the live animal, we can make a three-dimensional reconstruction of um, what the heart looks like and how this electrical impulse propagates through the heart. Okay. And then we can look at the voltage and the calcium at the same time. Okay, so why are we doing this? Well. In a fish, it starts as a single cell. It starts without a heart. And this cell is not electrically active. And then at some point, we have this organ where these cells are synchronized and they're beating. And we'd like to see how does this organ boot up. Do the cells start individually and then synchronize, or do they start all at once, or is there a focus from which this activity spreads? And which ions and ion channels are involved in this as a function of developmental stage? And we can just watch this. And so one of the things we're working on now in the lab is mapping the electrical maturation of this heart, trying to understand how does this organ start. But now, every cell in the fish has a um, membrane around it. And so I thought maybe there are places where we wouldn't think to look, but where there might be electrical activity going on. So an undergrad in my lab, Emma Dowd, made a new transgenic zebrafish which expresses this calcium and voltage indicator in every cell in its body. And so the idea is we're just going to look at this fish, and we're going to look at different points in development, and we'll poke it and do things to it, and try to see where do we see interesting electrical or calcium dynamics. And just to give you a flavor for this, here's this fish 
Um, and this is a calcium signal. And when we turned on the microscope, the fish didn't like the light from the microscope, and so it tried to swim away. And so you can see there's this impulse in a nerve here, and then this signal down its spine. It doesn't swim away because it's embedded in agar. Okay? But you can release it and then set the fish free at the end. All right. The last example I want to give of something surprising we saw looking um, at bioelectricity is in E. coli. So nobody had ever measured the voltage in any intact bacterium before, because they're too small to get an electrode into. And so we put one of these voltage indicators into E. coli, and we put them on a cover slip. And here we're not doing anything to the cells. We're just looking at them. And this movie is sped up about six times from real time. And you might see that these cells are blinking. So we discovered that bacteria generate electrical spikes a little bit like these electrical impulses in neurons. And we don't know why they do it, and we don't know how they do it. Okay? So we have no idea what the biology is or which ions or ion channels are involved here. And there are millions of species of bacteria in the world, and we don't know anything about the electrophysiology of any of them. And these bacteria are involved in industrially important processes, medically important processes, environmentally important processes. And this is an entirely unexplored area about the electrophysiology of these bacteria. But I'm sure it's important because these changes in membrane voltage regulate the energetics of every protein in the membranes of these cells. All right. So I want to finish uh, by talking just a little bit about where these genes come from that we're using. Our voltage indicator, this archaeoidopsin 3, comes from a microorganism that lives in the Dead Sea here. The channel rhodopsin that we use, this blue light activated ion channel, comes from a freshwater alga that lives in a pond in the south of England. In order to see this protein, we've fused it to another fluorescent protein, which comes from a coral. And then we've fused the archaeoidopsin to a different fluorescent protein from jellyfish. It's a different color, so we can see that one too. And then we actually link these two proteins to each other with a little sequence from a pig virus. Okay? And it's just incredible to me that we can take all of these genes, which evolved for totally different purposes from all over the world, and just staple them together to come up with these new tools which have functions which were never selected for in evolution. And I really think this is just, just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much natural diversity out there and function which has been selected for over the course of evolution that I think there will be tremendous opportunities for exploring and copying from these natural innovations to uh, play with these molecular tinker toys and to come up with new function. But the only reason we can do these things is because ecologists have been going around for decades classifying and studying these microorganisms. So this archaeoidopsin 3 was discovered in the early 1980s. And I'm sure that the um, ecologists going around in the mud here who found this single-celled organism never would have guessed that this protein would one day be in human neurons in a model of a human neurodegenerative disease. Right? So it's very hard to tell where basic research will go. And it's very important to conserve these places because we will never be able to invent things as um, beautiful as the things that you can find out there. Great. So um, I've worked with many wonderful colleagues um, on this project. I particularly want to mention Ed Boyden, who's a colleague at MIT, who gave us some of these genes to get started. Florian Engert helped us get started on the electrophysiology. Uh, he's a professor in uh, molecular and cellular biology here. Venki Murthy and uh, Bernardo Sabatini have been working with us on trying to do these measurements in intact mouse brains. And uh, we've collaborated with many other people on different aspects of this project. Kevin Egan on the stem cell work. Now, doing science uh, as a principal investigator is a little bit like being the coach of a basketball team. You can give advice, but you don't actually do the hard work. And the credit for success really belongs to the athletes and not to the coach. I've been incredibly fortunate to work with some extremely talented and dedicated and creative um, scientific athletes. Um, and here's a list of um, some of them. I'm not going to go through all of their names. I'll just mention Joel Kroll um, started this project as a postdoc in my lab. And he has now um, gone on to this company, which we founded, which is trying to make these tools more broadly available. 
Daniel Hochbaum and Adam Douglas got the first results in neurons, and then many other students in my lab have been working on improving these tools and applying them um, throughout, uh, throughout life. These people pay the bills. <laughs> this is a photo of my lab, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Great, so questions? Yes, sir. So can you measure things like PTSD and ITSD, you know, and yeah. excitatory postsynaptic? Yeah, so, so, so the question is, um, let me give a little background. When one neuron signals to another neuron, it doesn't always trigger the other neuron to fire. It induces just a little change in, in the voltage. And what a neuron does is it looks at all of these little electrical blips, some of which are positive and some of which are negative. And if all of those sum up to reach a critical value, then that will trigger the next neuron to fire. And so there's a lot of interest in not just looking at the firing, but also looking at these so-called sub-threshold events, all of the things that lead up to a neuron to fire. And they're small, and so they're difficult to see. But the answer is yes, we can see those. Yes, other questions? Yeah, in the back there. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, th this lipid, the, the skin around the cell, is actually a, sort of a liquid in two dimensions. Things can move around. And the question is, what's the influence of that? The time scale over which things redistribute within a cell is much longer than the time scales of these electrical impulses that we're looking at. And so um, things are not moving very far on the time scales we're looking. But an important question is, how does the physical environment around these proteins, as well as the other proteins of the membrane and their interactions with other things in the cell, affect um, the fluorescence? Are there other things that could lead to spurious signals? And that's something that, of course, we have to check very carefully. And so we do a lot of calibration measurements to um, check that the signals we're seeing really are coming from these electrical impulses, as opposed to other interactions with the environment. Also, follow-up, uh, are you hiring? Are we hiring? <laughs> Um, I have so, great respect for troublemakers in this, in this field, and I'm a very great technician. Great. Um, <laughs> send me an email. <laughs> yes. Great. Ike, you had a question? Or? Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, why don't that, since you don't, since you shouldn't thank yourself at the end, and Melissa seems to have disappeared, <laughs> why don't I take the uh. role of Melissa for a few minutes? Oh, okay. Yeah. Have, have you thought about uh, actually looking into the head or brain of an animal, ah. I mean, that would be the ideal thing. That's the dream. Um, so one of the dreams, or that's one of the dreams, is to take, say, one of these zebrafish, and instead of looking at its heart, to look in its brain and to see all those neurons, and then to tickle its tail and to watch the signal go into its brain, see all the processing, and then see it try to swim away or do whatever it's going to do. And um, we're working towards that. That turns out to be technically very difficult. The ch one of the challenges is that the brain is three-dimensional, while all the images I've showed you were basically two-dimensional. And once you start to stack things up on top of each other, the optical imaging becomes much more difficult, and you have to worry about all the stuff that's out of focus. Also, making these creatures, um, which express in every cell in the brain, turns out to be difficult. But we're sneaking up on it. And so we've started to work with um, slices of brain from mice. It turns out that if you slice the brain quickly, you can keep it alive for enough time that you can go in. And we've started to record from individual cells in the brains of mice. And um, I hope that with time, we'll be able to start to look um, in the whole brain. But technically, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Is the signal which is generated by uh, light of the genetic signal, is that comparable to a signal when a normal neuron is fighting, or is it way more? Because what struck me about the original observation about the mouse that got super aggressive against the gloves is that once the light went off, 
Yeah, yeah. So, so, so why? Yeah. Um, so th let me answer your first question, which the first part of that, which is what the relative strength of this optogenetic stimulation and the natural stimuli that the cell receives. We can tune the um, amount of light that we deliver to the cell. We can either give it a lot or a little. And we've gone to a lot of trouble to um, engineer these proteins, the optogenetic actuators, so that the range of stimuli that we can deliver matches what these things, what these neurons would experience in their normal function. And so we can either give stronger or weaker stimuli than you would naturally find, and we use those for different purposes. Now the question of what's going on with that mouse, why does it all of a sudden forget <laughs> the moment the light comes off? That's a, I think, a more difficult question, and I, I don't know the answer. A lot of these behaviors depend on where in the processing um, you intervene. Um, it's, and this is presumably an intervention at a sufficiently low level that this mouse, I mean, I don't know if the mouse knows anything, but it doesn't know why it's attacking the glove. It's just doing it. Yeah. That's a speculation. Yeah? Could you, could you watch the firing of neurons during development? Ah, it's a great question. So um, just as with the heart in the fish, we would love to watch the brain boot up and uh, to see how these neurons fire and, and how their firing patterns affect development. There's probably a two-way street there. Um, in order to do that, we need to first uh, solve Ike's challenge of being able to see the neurons in the intact brain. And again, that's something we're working on, and I, we're very interested in doing that. Um, finding exactly the right organism and the right creature for doing the right system for doing that is something that uh, we're still trying to figure out. And so it might be fish, it might be worms. Uh, mice are probably pretty difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are many technical challenges. I've talked about the proteins in the biology, but there's also a lot of challenge on the hardware and the instrumentation. And there are several things which make this a difficult challenge. Yes, if we had faster cameras, it would be better. Um, one of the challenges that we run up against is, you know, as you run a camera faster and faster, the images get dimmer. You're dividing your photons among more frames. And so we're pretty close to the point where we're just running out of photons. And there's no point running the camera faster than the rate at which photons come in to each pixel. And so for that, we need brighter reporters, things which give us more photons. Another challenge, which wasn't obvious at the beginning but turns out to be actually a serious issue, is that taking these high-resolution, extremely high-speed videos generates a tremendous amount of data. So coming off our camera, we're getting about a gigabyte of data per second. And just storing that data, not to mention analyzing it, is a very serious problem. And so now we're starting to work with, um, with computer scientists and actually some astrophysicists who face similar problems from telescopes, trying to figure out how do you deal with these huge data streams. And then there's the challenge of interpreting it, relating these patterns of blinks to the actual underlying biology of the cell. And again, that's a problem which um, there isn't a general solution for. In a sense, you know, people had been so limited by the ability to measure cells one at a time. I think there was a perception that if we could just do this optical electrophysiology, all of a sudden, uh, all of our problems would be solved. But in fact, what happens is we just ran into other problems. And so now we're trying to work out the whole pipeline. Yeah? How big a problem is bleaching in the system? Ah, it's a great question. So many fluorescent molecules, when you shine light on them, uh, they fluoresce for a while, and then something off pathway happens, and the molecule goes dark. The proteins that we work with turn out, just by good luck, to be extremely photostable. And so um, you can image continuously for a couple of minutes before you start to see serious photobleaching. It turns out the big problem we face is that these proteins are extremely dim. So uh, they're about 100 times dimmer than GFP, this green fluorescent protein, which is sort of the standard for this biological fluorescence imaging. And so that's a big problem, and we need to shine a lot of light in order to overcome that, uh, that dimness. Yeah, group pink. Uh, I'm interested in your, like, your company dealing with the attack, uh, dealing with attack tumor cells. And there are great variability between different tumors. So I saw your image during, uh, during there, but that's the difference between two kinds of IPI cells. So 
and the difference can be small. So how can you know that the difference is critical for the disease or not? Great. So Griefing was asking, every person is different. And so if you're going to compare cells from one person to another person, how do you know that the difference you see is relevant, say, to the disease, as opposed to just the fact that everybody's different? In the experiment that I showed here, both sets of cells came from the same person. And the genome was edited in order to uh, correct, to control for background genetic variation. But you can't always do that. For genetically complex diseases, or diseases where we don't even know the genetic basis, which is most of these diseases, then uh, we don't know where to edit. And so you have to compare one to the other. And that's exactly the same uh, challenge that um, every drug company faces when they do a clinical trial, which is that everybody's different. And the only way to overcome that is with statistics. You have to look at many people, many people who are healthy, and many people who have the disease, and then ask at the population level, do these um, assort into two different groups? And that's another reason why it's very important to have high throughput measurements. You really need to be able to look at hundreds of cells, possibly from dozens or hundreds of people, in order to make meaningful conclusions when you can't do these isogenic controls. I do not know if they're going to be refreshments. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what to say. Okay. But uh, this has been a fantastic lecture. So everyone join me in thanking Adam.